Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Whale Sanctuary Project live webinar for today. We are going to be talking about a very special topic, cetacean sanctuaries as centers for whale communication research. I'm Lori Marino, the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that this is Truth and Reconciliation Day in Canada. And we support the indigenous communities throughout the nation. As you know, the Whale Sanctuary Project is creating a permanent sanctuary for whales who uh, come from entertainment parks in Nova Scotia. A sanctuary is a place of refuge, a place where animals can be themselves. Thus, the priority of authentic sanctuaries is, is really the well being and the autonomy of the whales. Studies of their psychology, physiology, and behavior, however, are necessary to monitor how they are adapting to the sanctuary environment. So it, an important point to make is that we're not setting up the sanctuary to be a lab. We are setting up the sanctuary and by virtue of having to care for the animals, monitor them, understand them, how they're adapting, we need to take data. We need to do science. We need to observe. We need to record. And in the process of doing that, we want to be able to do that in a way that helps us to understand them and other cetaceans as well. All data collection, therefore, must be non-intrusive and non-invasive. Today, we're honored. I, I'm really honored to have as guests leading scientists who are on the cutting edge of studying animal communication in ways that are not only non-invasive and highly innovative, but also ethically guided. I've asked each of them to tell you a bit about their work and then we're gonna discuss some of the ways that their work might be relevant to the, to the sanctuary. Um, what's interesting, and I'll say the word interesting here because uh, before one of, one of us, Aza Raskin and I were talking earlier, and he mentioned to me that the root of the word interesting is intersection. And I think that's what we have here today is an intersection of minds, an intersection of conversations and expertise, which I think is, is very, very exciting. So let me introduce each one of my guests. And then I'm going to give you a very brief PowerPoint update on the sanctuary in Nova Scotia to provide context for our discussion. So first, uh, Valeria Vergara. Valeria uh, has a PhD in zoology from the University of British Columbia, and, and she's known for her groundbreaking studies of beluga whale communication, both in captivity and in the wild. She's discovered contact calls between beluga whale mothers and calves and between adults. And her work has really illuminated the impacts of anthropogenic noise on beluga communication. So thank you, Valeria. It's great to have you here. Aza Raskin is a mathematician who is co-founder and executive director of the Earth Species Project, a nonprofit organization devoted to decoding non-human communication and creating better interspecies understanding. He is also co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology, and he is a writer, inventor, entrepreneur, and so much more. So thank you, Asia. Brenda McCowan is a biological anthropologist and professor in the School of Veterinary Medicine at UC Davis. She's interested in vocal and social complexity in primates and cetaceans as a way to enhance their welfare and to conserve them. She and our colleagues use information theory, which you'll hear about among other tools to assess the diversity, complexity and development 
of communicative repertoires across a wide range of species. Welcome, Bren. David Gruber is the Presidential Professor of Biology and Environmental Sciences at Baruch College in New York and National Geographic Explorer. He's the founder and lead of Project SETI, Cetacean Translation Initiative, an interdisciplinary project that is aimed at decoding sperm whale communication using advanced AI. He's currently working with Shane Giro on the Dominica Sperm Whale Project. Welcome, David. And last but not least, Jim Crutchfield. Jim is a physicist at UC Davis and director of the Complexity Sciences Center. Uh, his interests are in complex systems, pattern discovery, and, and how these can be applied to understanding non-human communication systems. Among many other pursuits, Jim is applying his work in, in pattern discovery to communication in Wales. Uh, but his research spans from evolutionary dynamics to collective cognition and computational mechanics. So welcome, Jim. Welcome all of you. Thank you very much for being here. So with that, I'm going to start off uh, with a little framework by just giving you a very, very brief update on the Whale Sanctuary Project. Some of you know that uh, for many years, we've all been uh, interested and concerned about the welfare of dolphins and whales living in concrete tanks. Uh, we know now that their welfare is quite poor and they suffer from a number of categorical abnormalities, one being systemic illness and opportunistic infection, uh, pneumonia, yeast infections, ulcers, encephalitis, those kinds of diseases. They also show common behavioral signs of mental illness, stereotypies, repetitive abnormal behaviors like circling, self-mutilation, grating their teeth on the sides of hard surfaces, banging their heads and their bodies against the sides of tanks, and behaviors that look like depression, anorexia, logging on the surface. And finally, we know that Dolphins and whales living in entertainment parks also suffer disturbed social interactions. They exhibit hyperaggression towards other dolphins and whales, including calves and including trainers and visitors to the parks. And there is a long history of failure to attach and thrive in calves. So we want dolphins and whales to go from this people standing on them, riding them, confining them to small tanks, forcing them to do things that are unnatural to this, providing for them an opportunity to regain some of their autonomy and their authenticity as whales and dolphins. And this is uh, a photograph, an aerial photograph from a drone of our sanctuary site in Nova Scotia. Our site is in Sherbrooke, Port Hilford, which is about two hours east of Halifax in Nova Scotia. And you can see where the sanctuary site is going to be, closer to the, to the uh, opening of, of the bay. This is an enormous bay and we are going to be able to create a sanctuary that's at least 100 acres. This is a rendering of that sanctuary. So this is a rendering, a drawing of the photo I just showed you um, with the same landmarks here with a, a, a net cork and a cork line that's about 100 acres, depth to 16, 17 meters, excellent currents and flow. And uh, we will have uh, space for six to eight beluga whales and two to three, maybe four orcas in a separate area. It's important to really remember what an authentic sanctuary is, that it's a place for the animals to have an opportunity to thrive for the first time in their lives. 
for their well-being and individualized lifetime care to be the priorities, not shows, not anything else. No performances, no greeting, no unnecessary invasive procedures. A full promotion of autonomy and a natural life as much as possible. It's still captivity, but it is a very different kind of life than they live in concrete tanks. We will be able to do authentic education, conservation, research, and share our data. We also will be responsible for keeping the environment and the sanctuary sustainable. And authentic sanctuaries are also located in community that embraces the sanctuary mission. And that certainly is the Sherbrooke community. So with that very, very brief introduction to the Whale Sanctuary Project, I really want to get into the really, really interesting presentations that my guests have prepared. And I'd like to start uh, with Valeria. Thank you, Laurie, for that. I'm very excited about this. I do want to take a, a moment, though, to um, again uh, mention that that in Canada today, this is the first ever National Day for Truth and, and Reconciliation to honor and remember all those children that, that died uh, while attending residential schools um, and the survivors and families and communities that are still affected. Um, by this horrible legacy. Um, so I just thought it, it, it would be very important to mention this. It is, it is a pivotal day, uh, really, that I, I personally hope um, uh, deepens our awareness of the, of the systemic issues and attitudes that are still uh, very much a part, that, that very much exist, that have led to, to, to the devastating residential school system uh, in Canada. And for me, this means... Uh, uh, and I hope for a lot of us, this means reflecting on, on what reconciliation really means and what uh, as non-Indigenous people um, uh, we can do to, to advance it and to stop perpetuating those, those systems of oppression. Um, so with that said, um, I also would like to acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded territories of the uh, uh, Masquium, Squamish and, and Tsleil-Waututh um, uh, nations. Okay, so uh, belugas, as many or probably all of you know, are one of the most vocal mammals uh, out there. And I've spent the last, I would say nearly two decades of my life uh, uh, studying uh, uh, how these incredibly social and long-lived long uh, beings communicate in an underwater world. And I started out my early days uh, studying them in captivity, actually, at the Vancouver Aquarium until 2008, attempting initially to understand what the function of some of their calls uh, is and how they develop uh, their huge, uh, hugely complex uh, repertoire. And this is where I initially uh, found uh, discovered contact calls, which are biologically critical calls used for group cohesion and for mother calf contact. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you can hear that, but they sound like creaky doors, very different than the chirps of, and whistles of the, the rest of the beluga repertoire. And calves first make very underdeveloped calls um, and they, they need to really learn the adult repertoire very much like human toddlers uh, or even like bird, uh, bird uh, subsong. And then I, I moved my studies to the, to the wild. Uh, I confirmed that uh, contact calls exist indeed in several locations. Other authors uh, did the same thing. So, so contact calls uh, started to become prominent in the literature. And when we study contact calls, one of the things that as biologists we're curious about is understanding what identity information is in those contact calls. Uh, and the amount and type of identity information provided by, by calls is really linked to social organization. And in, in very socially fluid species that tend to be, for example, uh, dolphins, uh, contact calls tend to be individually distinctive. Uh, uh, these are like vocal signatures that, that are like a sonic tag of sorts. And in terms of their social ecology, belugas fit this group of fission fusion society very, very well. They are the butterflies of the whale world, essentially. 
uh, they form matrilineal groups that periodically join and, and split other groups, and they form very long-term relationships and friendships with, with uh, uh, other non-related belugas. Females take care of each other young. Juveniles form kindergartens, and they are babysat by, by older juveniles, and they form communities and networks very much like human societies. So to, to maintain all these very complex uh, social and long-term social interactions, they would need presumably a way to uh, keep track of one another in, in, a, in a dark um, uh, aquatic environment. Um, so I, I began looking into this uh, business of whether belugas have uh, individually distinct calls or, or names in Cunningham Inlet in 2014 and 2015, where I spent a, a lot of uh, um, hours on a research tower and on shore. Um, and mothers and crafts from the Eastern High Arctic Buffin Bay population uh, uh, spend about four to five weeks uh, every summer in this location. And uh, there, uh, as, as, uh, there was a series of, of uh, very temporary but, but constant periodic entrapments of whales that would get trapped in river canals. And all they would do in, in those, during those entrapments was produce contact calls. So it, it, this was really a phenomenally uh, great opportunity to, to study contact calls in a natural uh, environment and compare those contact calls to uh, the ones produced by, by uh, the, um, the wild uh, free-ranging herd. And uh, we had the fortune to have uh, drones that allowed us to, um, to uh, fly over the entrapped whales and be able to tell exactly who was there, the group composition and how many animals in each, in each group, which was really important to correlate the number of animals and especially the number of adults and juveniles, uh, excluding calves, to uh, the number, the diversity of contact calls produced in each entrapment. Um, so then we spent a long time, my research assistant and I, this took literally almost two years, going through each uh, entrapment and, and uh, classifying all the different, very stereotyped contact calls, coming up with a catalog for each of the, of the entrapment uh, events. And then we run this by 69 judges. This is something for those of you uh, unaware of this technique, it's, it's a widely used technique in bioacoustics. Um, uh, you know, humans are very still, we're still very good at pattern recognition. The recognition. So this is actually my daughter doing the test uh, with, with headphones and visually. And the interesting thing is that there was a very high inter-observer uh, uh, classification agreement. So the judges agreed with each other about the classification and they agreed with us, the, the, the biologists. Um, so we were satisfied that we hadn't pulled this classification out of a hat. And then of course, the cool part was that the more individuals in an entrapment, the more contact call types we had. So this is, and this is down to, you know, the, the single entrapment that had one animal had a single contact call type. So this provided the basis for our paper that provides um, preliminary evidence that, that um, you know, that sonic name tags are indeed a part of the beluga whale repertoire, that they very much have these names of sorts. But we don't know if these are truly individual or shared perhaps with, with closely related individuals or with friends. So we are continuing this study in the St. Lawrence estuary, which is a reproductively and geographically isolated population. Um, and uh, there uh, has been a long term, for many years, this is a very long term photo identification study of these uh, endangered belugas in this population. And this provides an ideal opportunity to begin to pair contact calls with known individuals in the population by identifying the vocalizer using temporary acoustic attacks. These are non-intrusive. They have suction cups and they're literally stamped on the whale. They swim around uh, carrying the, the, the recording uh, tag for a couple of hours and then it falls off naturally and you pick it up from the, from the water and you have a recording of the, of the sounds that the whale has uh, produced. And another thing, so, so this is, we're still analyzing those data. Um, and another thing we are doing, and this is through my PhD student, Jacqueline Oben, uh, is uh, we're looking at uh, uh, whether we can identify three hypothetical 
uh, female communities in the St. Lawrence by their contact called repertoires. So that's just a, a bit of an overview of the kinds of studies that we're leading in the St. Lawrence. And understanding how noise impacts whales is very much related to the study of, of cetacean communication. So I've been studying this for a number of, of years. Um, the St. Lawrence Seaway is a very industrialized area. In, in much of it, belugas are exposed uh, to noise from recreational and, and commercial vessel uh, traffic. And so um, understanding how underwater noise impacts the ability of belugas to stay in touch with one another, especially mothers and calves, is uh, very important. And so we did, a, we conducted a lot of this study uh, from a tower that we erected in, in Bay St. Marguerite, which is an, a really important area of high residency for, for mothers and calves. And we had a hydrophone and uh, uh, we flew a drone and we synchronized the recordings and uh, uh, with, the, with the visuals. This is an example. So I don't know how well you're listening, you're, you know, this can be heard, but essentially this allowed us to uh, look at group composition in relation to um, the, the proportional usage of contact calls. Uh, so, you know, do groups with females and calves use contact calls more often than groups of males? Um, there were a, a number of other very important pieces of this puzzle that I'm not going to bore you with uh, today. Um, but you can read the paper. But uh, the important part here is the conclusion, which is that the maximum communication ranges of beluga calls are about 18 times larger for adults than for calves. Um, and that newborn beluga calves are particularly uh, sensitive to increases in, in underwater noise. And we arrived at this conclusion from uh, the data that came predominantly from the St. Lawrence, but also from a uh, um, captive calf at Oceanographic Aquarium that provided the, the calf data. Um, and finally, another area where I've conducted field studies is the Churchill River Estuary, where I've also used the synchronization of footage and hydrophone recordings to understand call usage in relation to group uh, composition and activity. And unfortunately, in, during the last couple of years, I had to, to, to cancel my trips uh, to Churchill because of a certain pandemic we're undergoing, and hopefully um, that will change uh, next year. Uh, thank you, and uh, yeah, very much looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Valeria. A lot oh, there to, to unpack and, and talk about. Next up is Asa. Awesome, thank you. Valeria, that was, your work is always just so cool. <laughs> you, Asa. Blown away. Um, uh, and honestly, I'm just really like excited and privileged um, and honored to be with all these incredibly brilliant thinkers and, and doers. Um, uh, so I'm Asa Raskin. Um, I'm one of the three co-founders for the Earth Species Project. Um, the other two are, are Britt Selvatel and Katie Zakarian. Um, we are actually, let me, let me start my screen share. Um, so you get something slightly more interesting than my face. So let's go with much more interesting. Oops. And I think I need to make sure when I do this, share sound, optimize for video, share. All right. Can you guys see this? Yes. Awesome. Um, so uh, yeah, so Earth Species Project, we're an open source nonprofit um, and we're dedicated to decoding non-human communication um, and you know, seeing if there are such things as uh, non-human languages out there. And we're using techniques developed really only in the last couple of years and from the field of unsupervised machine learning and translation. Um, so we're, we're starting with, with whales, like belugas, humpbacks, dolphins, and the likes, but also uh, primates, and we're eventually hoping to get to birds, um, corvids. Um, I always get that confused with covids now. Uh, but we're working across um, a whole bunch of uh, different species with different biologists and different collaborators. Um, and in fact, pretty much everyone here on the call, we either have collaborated with or are collaborating with um, and our team is, is global. We're now seven technologists and AI experts. We've, members of our team have published, published on everything from like 
AI generation of singing, human singing and speech to automatic detection of sperm whale dialects. Actually, that, uh, Peter Bermont did that work with, with David Gruber um, and, and a team uh, to, to neural inspired models of, of human hearing. Um, and you know we're, we're open source, like our goal is, and we're nonprofit, our goal is really both do the AI work towards you know, decoding non-human communication and along the way build tools that are useful for, for everyone, like all, all the biologists and, and scientific field. So you can, you can find us on, on GitHub and follow along as, as we go. Um, and so the first question is like, uh, you know, is there even a language? Is there a there, there? And it, there are lots of really fascinating studies to pick up. One, one of my favorites is this uh, Braslau and Schneck um, unpublished thesis. I recently learned about this from Diana Reese, um, where they taught dolphins two gestures. And the first gesture was innovate, do something you haven't done before. And what I think is really beautiful is that it worked. Dolphins can learn the idea, the concept of new thing. And to do that, you have to remember all the things you've done um, and then understand the concept of not that. Um, but dolphins understand that and we can communicate. And then they taught a second gesture, which was do something together. And they would say to the dolphins, do something you haven't done before this session together. And they would go down and exchange sonic information and come up and do the same thing they hadn't done before that session at the same time. And while that doesn't prove representational language or anything else, it certainly makes you go, hmm. Um, so part of, oh, we're doing a whole bunch of, of things along the path towards trying to decode non-human non communication. Um, but the place that we uh, have started is in something called the cocktail party problem. That is the ability to separate out multiple animals speaking at once from one microphone into their own individual tracks, sort of like on GarageBand, because you can't really decode language unless you can untangle conversation. So to start with, I'll play some beluga communication, just because I, every time I hear it, it still gives me frisson. Hey. Yeah. Which, to me, that sounds like some kind of alien modem. It's so dense. Um, I'm so uh, envious of Valeria getting to spend so much time uh, with, with these incredible animals. And it's actually something we learned from Valeria, and Valeria, please make sure I'm getting this right, that in some of your research with tags on the belugas, um, you were only able to use 3% of the contact calls because it was really hard to determine who was saying what because they're all swimming around each other and, and sometimes they'll talk into each other's tags. Um, it's sort of, it's, it's mixed up. So figuring out who's speaking and separating them onto their own tracks would be super helpful. Um, here's an example, this data comes from Lisa Walker um, for humpbacks uh, vocalizing together. So you can sort of tell there are a lot of whales and it's very hard to tell what's going on in this audio whale soup. Um, so we have a paper um, uh, in preprint, uh, hopefully coming out soon. Um, Peter Berman did a lot of this research on how do you take a, use an AI to listen to these kinds of data streams and separate them out into their own individual channels. Um, uh, we're using a, a whole bunch of specific techniques like UNETs. If you're interested, go check out the, the, the paper, but I wanna just show you some of the examples because I think they're really cool. So this actually comes uh, from, uh, these are dog barks and the data comes from, from Brenda. Um, uh, and what you're going to hear is we, took two individual dog barks that we know are separate, we mix them together, and we're asking the AI to separate them out again. So the first thing you're going to hear is the dogs together, and then separate them out in, in, into individual ones. So you can see, even though 
the dog barks are mixed up both in the harmonic sense and in the temporal sense. The AI has learned how to pick them out. But you might say, fine, but maybe dogs are really easy because maybe it's two different species. And so it's just using species to pick them apart. So here is another example. These are of macaque monkeys. Um, this is uh, data from Fukushima. Um, and these are three macaque monkeys vocalizing at the same time. Again, we mix them together from individual sources and are asking the AI to separate them out. So you'll hear all three and then each one pulled out by the AI individually. What I think is so cool about this is like, this is something that my human brain cannot do. Um, and to do it, the AI is starting to start to model what does a macaque or what does a dog sound like? What is the, their priors, the distribution of the kinds of calls they make? How do they speak? If there's a grammar, what's the grammar? What's the syntax in order to do this kind of work? This um, now is moving into the cetacean world with dolphins. This is data from Leila Sayi. Um, and you can, you can hear the dolphins mixed together and then separated. And you know, we just started to play around with it with humpback whales. Again, data from Lisa Walker. And then separated. Other one. I just think this is really cool because what this enables is taking data where we don't know who's speaking and it potentially opens up the ability to separate it out and recover all of those datas that we've had to throw away before. Now, the caveat is, is that we're super early in this. And so we can only do this with sort of in the lab kind of synthetic data. We haven't yet applied this to be able to take a real data stream live from the field, which has noise and lots of other uh, uh, challenges and separate it out, but that's sort of some of our next step. And so where is this all going? Why are we even doing this in the first place? Um, there were two really interesting uh, AI breakthroughs um, in the last 10 years. Um, the first is a 2013 uh, where, uh, paper, which showed you could take a language and represent it as a shape. Imagine a galaxy where every star is a word, words that mean similar things are near each other and words that share a geometric relationship or a, a conceptual relationship share a geometric relationship. So that is like, you know, king is to man as woman is to queen. And so if you think about it, like dog has relationship to man, dog has relationship to wolf, dog has relationship to cat, dog has relationship to mailman. Um, it sort of fixes it given all those relationships in a point in space. And if you solve every relationship of every word to every other word. It's like solving a multi-dimensional hyper-complex Sudoku puzzle and out pops a rigid shape. So that was known. But in 2017, a really surprising result happened, which is that you could translate between two languages, human languages, text, without the need of any examples of how to translate and without the need for any Rosetta Stone or dictionary. And the way it did it is that you asked the AI to build up that shape, say for Japanese, you build up that shape for uh, German and you just match the shapes together. And the point which is dog ends up being at the roughly the same place in both languages. And that works for English and Japanese and German and Spanish and Esperanto and Finnish, which is a weird language in Aramaic and Urdu. It appears that most human languages share a kind of universal human meaning shape. And I just find that, especially in tide of such division, so fundamentally beautiful. And so the question we're asking is one, can we extend these techniques from text to audio? That's at the edge of machine learning. And then two, if given enough data, can we build the shape for animal communication, see if and how it fits into the human space, which parts fit and which parts don't? Um, and that's sort of where we are going to attempt to do translation. I think it's, you know, humans have been around vocalizing um, for maybe 100,000 years. These dolphins uh, and whales for 30 million years. Just imagine the kinds of, of wisdom that they might contain. 
So I think of where we are right now. It's, it's as, as if these new AI techniques are the invention of the telescope. And these new large scale data sets are the stars in the galaxy above. And we are just turning the telescope upward and imagine what we're gonna find. So thank you so much. Again, Earth Species Project, and you can check us out on the web, or if you go to earthspecies.org slash discord, you can join our, our community and just ask questions uh, and get involved. So thank you very much. Uh, after hearing that talk and two others that came before it, I am imagining all kinds of things. So <laughs> um, let's continue on so we can get to our discussion. Uh, Brenda, would you like to tell us about your work next? Yes, absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. So as Laurie mentioned, um, much of my research over the past several decades has primarily focused on the social and vocal behavior of captive non-human primates and dolphins with really one important goal of enhancing their health and well-being. But I've also been fortunate enough to conduct research on a diversity of other species, ranging from domesticated pet and farm animal species to wild populations of ungulates, non-human primates, and whales. And a, and a subset of this work involves the use of bioacoustics to better understand how and what animals communicate about, utilizing both observational and experimental approaches. So at Laura's request, this got me thinking about how one might use bioacoustics in the setting of a whale sanctuary. And this led to a framework that I'm calling a bioacoustic toolkit for assessing health and well being. And I see this toolkit as being comprised of three interconnected components bioacoustic monitoring, which Lori's already talked a little bit about, playback probing, and acoustic enrichment. And I'd like to briefly visit what each of these might contribute to such a goal. So, first, uh, we might use passive acoustic monitoring to assess what I would call the healthiness of an animal's vocal output as a proxy for overall health and well being. And we can potentially do that by examining uh, four basic aspects of vocal communication. For example, as we did with chickens, we might use bioacoustic signatures of stress or well being using the concept of motivational structural rules to examine the effective content of whale calls. We might also use bioacoustics to track the degree of aggression or patterns of affiliation at the individual and even the group level that are indicative of good welfare, as we have done with rhesus macaques and dogs. Similarly, we could consider using the diversity of call types, especially, especially given belugas, right? The frequency of their use and the combination of those calls perhaps using approaches such as information theory in comparison to normative vocal patterns for each species as another metric for well-being. And finally, we might assess the success of introducing new animals from different facilities using metrics of acoustic convergence as one proxy for social cohesion. And clearly such a tool used in this semi-captive environment would reap benefits for field research because of what we will learn about whale communication in these more closed, more simple, sim simpler systems that could be applied to the study of our field subjects. And conversely, we can use what we learn about whale communication from our field studies to better manage animals in the sanctuary, thus providing reciprocal benefit. Playback studies um, provide another important tool that could allow us to actively probe individual health and well-being. Using an acoustic playback design, we could assess interest and motivation of animals by examining their acoustic and behavioral responses to both conspecific and heterospecific sounds. We could also use playbacks to provide familiar, preferably pleasurable, human-made sounds as a potential source of comfort to the whales as they transition to their new environment. And, then, and this latter thought actually leads to the third component, that of acoustic enrichment. So such playbacks and the resulting responses could, could likely serve as a form of enrichment. But we might ask ourselves, could we go one step further to develop interactive acoustic systems that provide both acoustic and cognitive enrichment? Interactive systems provide choice and control to the animals, which allows us to ask questions about individual preferences, which in turn informs us how to better tailor the environment uh, to um, the animal's needs and desires. And if designed properly, it can also provide insights into their own communication systems which um, for example, Diana Reese and I found in an interactive keyboard study conducted with captain dolphins years ago. 
Thus again, this tool is reciprocal in benefit because conducting these types of non-invasive experiments in the more closed sanctuary setting will guide field experimentation to more effectively reveal what wild populations of whales are communicating about. However, the goal of developing such an optimized bioacoustic toolkit is not without its challenges. First, we need to have some degree of understanding of each species communication system to start, and for beluga whales, that's Valeria. Um, but we also require some technical advances, uh, and this list, list includes some things like automated real-time recording and call detection, the solution to the cocktail party problem that Aziz just showed you is starting to occur, automated signal analysis, measurement and classification schemes uh, to help us uh, do things in real time, in addition to just recording and call detection, and the development of interactive and, and uh, preferably dynamically interactive systems for interacting, for actually exchanging with whales. Um, so, uh, however, because we are beginning to address such important advances, uh, as rep represented by the other panel members here today that we'll be talking, I'm very optimistic that such challenges can be overcome in the near future. So these bioacoustic toolkits can be developed to provide us with an additional avenue beyond the more traditional approaches that we currently take for effectively assessing the health and well-being of sanctuary as well as, well as other populations of whales. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. I mean, I, I hope everyone, including our audience, is beginning to see how this is really taking shape in a very exciting way because we have the task in the sanctuary of caring for these animals, understanding who they are and how they are adjusting to their new environment over time. That's our responsibility uh, in, in caring for them. And at the same time, I think we're beginning to see through Brenda's work, Valeria's, Aza, and now David and Jim are going to talk about how the, this, this task becomes a way to uh, catalyze really uh, innovative ways to study these animals, uh, creative out of the box ways to do this. So it's very, very exciting. And this is just one in a series of discussions that we are going to have about this. I'd like to turn to our next speaker, David Gruber. Oh, thank you, Lori. Well, it's, um... It's such a pleasure to be here today, and um, you know I'm honored to be here with such um, such amazing colleagues. and And thank you so much for for all the hard work in organizing this panel and um, and all the care that you put into this sanctuary project. I'm I'm hoping I can just contribute to this dialogue in in a in, in a helpful way. So really, just to give a, a background of uh, just where I'm coming to for this conversation. Um, the body of work that I've done up until now has been trying to see the world from the perspective of other mammals. And I've mainly been working with, uh, with vision, um, designing uh, cameras that see like sharks, studying the apparatus of the, of the eye, um, and then coming up with a camera that could essentially see the world from their perspective. So trying to get myself behind the, the perspective of the animal to see it from a non-human perspective. Um, in 2015, we made this surprise uh, discovery of a, of a biofluorescent turtle, and it was something, a new feature that we found on turtles, but that also led to trying to think about, well, what is the turtle's world like, and how can, you know, how can we see like these mythic creatures? And um, so with uh, Dr. Dariara Kayak, we, we, we used hyperspectral cameras and imagery and studied the eyes of the turtles and the oil droplets in their eyes. And, modeled everything to, to try to our best in first order principles to come up with a, a camera, which is uh, always fun to try to even imagine how we see colors in the world are gonna be very different how other animals. And even to model this right, you need to get right down there um, to see the color of the spectrum underwater um, to be able to come up with an indication of what that turtle is seeing. But once you kind of back your way out of this, you could start doing really fun things like, you know, looking from our human perspective and modeling this from a, from a turtle's perspective and from a shark's perspective and really trying to just get us out of our, our human mindset. Um, the other thing that I think is important that I hope to bring to, bring to this conversation is the, is the importance of using technology today as gentle as possible. Um, and how can we, 
um, have a future where the technology is really symbiotic with with humans and um, and um, that's that's led to a longstanding collaboration with Rob Wood at the Harvard Microbiotics Lab, um, where recently we've come up with uh, one of the most gentle robots in the world. This is an ultra gentle robot that that could interact with a jellyfish at one tenth the pressure that the human eyelid is resting on the eyeball. Um, but that was also making us think like, well, how do I know that jellyfish is not experiencing stress? And we're able to use modern genomic techniques such as transcriptomics um, on a study that we published in Current Biology to, to show that using um, no stress versus the softer techniques versus a rougher technique, um, this is an animal, of course, a jellyfish that can't talk to us, but through these kinds of modern techniques, we could find out if we're um, giving the animal less stress or not. And, um, and I think that's important as we work with animals to, to just really be very thoughtful into our techniques and, and how to minimize them. Um, here was another, we're even thinking in future into the deep sea on how eventually we could look at deep sea organisms without actually bringing them to the surface. And we study them down there without, without bringing them up. But for more important for today is Project CT, um, which is a new initiative and nonprofit that started in 2020. And it's, um, it's also a TED Audacious project. And the goal is to really bring together some leading roboticists, some whale biologists, such as you mentioned Shangaro, um, and, and Roger Payne, to, um, as well as AI specialists, such as um, Dan Daniela Roos and Michael Bronstein, um, to be able to come together and create a custom data set. Um, Shane's work over, over 15 years in Dominica has um, showed many interesting things about sperm whales, that they have distinct dialects. And this was just over, you know, with, um, within the, in the, the, the thousands of uh, annotated um, pieces of data. So our goal is really to bring um, something that was been into the thousands up into the millions and tens of millions and maybe even billions. A little bit of just how we're doing it. We're calling this a, a listening project and our, our core technology really is hundreds of microphone arrays that will be fixed there and cover a, a 20 square kilometer um, which will be able to passively listen 24 seven um, and localize the, uh, the, the animals there. And that data will then be brought through our processing team, through the machine learning, through our linguist team. Um, we're also looking at things like um, human in the loop where the, 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 the people at the surface that are also contacting, that are also collecting context information of the, of the socializations will be able to input that information into the machine learning algorithms. And we're really gonna be focusing on this project with, uh, with mother calves. And essentially we're trying to be a baby, uh, a baby whale in this project. And um, you know the same way in which uh, a baby whale um, would learn language from the mother to, um, to try to train the computers to be the same. So I'll leave it there. And I'm excited to, um, excited to, to chat with everyone. Thank you so much, David. I very much appreciate that. Uh... Got a lot, a lot to talk about. Let's get to our last speaker so that we can get right into our discussion. Uh, Jim, would you like to take it away? Great. Uh, thank, thanks, Lori. Um, so I, we were talking a little bit beforehand. This all started. David said, oh, I'm, I've never studied whales before. Well, that's also the case for me, and I guess a little bit for Brenda, too. Um, so I'm approaching this as... Uh, I guess I'll kind of bracket things here. On the one hand, I'm thinking um, what motivates me in this project are some conceptual issues. What is intelligence? And the sort of test case is what is non-human intelligence? But then I also like building systems. So you'll see some parallels with, with David's project, what I'm going to talk about. So let me get started here. Share my screen. Share sound. Good. Okay. Hopefully you can all see that. Yes, yep. thumbs, thumbs yep. up, very good. Okay, so uh, this is actually, I have to admit, uh, a talk I gave um, after my first field season with Brenda and the rest of our team up in Southeast Alaska. It's called the Inside Passage, the Alaskan Panhandle. Um, and I called it N whales from M hydrophones. So in some sense, it's kind of a generalization of what Aza was talking about, but it's very much in the spirit of how can we track these interesting animals in a minimally non-invasive way. Well, 
they're kind of challenging the study because for some reason they just stay underwater all the time. <laughs> so you can't see them. Um, and their world, you end up realizing their umwelt is, is, is largely acoustic. And Lori's done some great work at trying to figure out what the uh, cortical structures are that support kind of visualizing and building maps of their a little bit visual, mostly acoustic worlds. So you have to come to them you know, on their, on their own terms, namely, um, they're largely acoustic animals. So, but, uh, but I wanted to show you, um, Brenda and I just got back from a field season up in Southeast Alaska uh, during, during August. And I wanted to show you uh, some of the footage that we got there and sound. Hopefully this will come through, technical fingers crossed. So this is So <clears throat> pretty amazing. Um, obviously we're studying humpback whales, you know, uh, 40 to 50 feet long, 40 to 50 tons. And when they decide to go for a walk or jump out of the water, they make these huge breaching noises that travel for many, many miles. But what's sort of interesting there is you can hear some of the acoustic uh, uh, repartee between them. That's part of their coordination, we think. So, so when we ask this question about non-human intelligence, the many different levels at which this, this challenge comes at us. One is what you just saw, maybe some kind of social interaction. We think we heard some kind of communication, but then if I were to you know, throw the hydrophone in like we did and record those signals, how do we pull out where the meaning is? So, and these different levels in, in this kind of intelligence hierarchy are all related. In fact, where does meaning come from how did communication evolve? And then how does that facilitate social organization? Each one of these levels informs the other. So one of the conceits in, in our study is that by studying various kinds of social functional behavior like bubble net feeding, um, like you just saw um, and breaching, that, um, that gives us some idea at the low level signals what vocal components could possibly mean and how that relates to the social functional behavior. So the strategy that we're taking, and this is a project funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation through the SETI Institute, that's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute uh, with, with um, Lawrence Doyle, the principal investigator, is we're taking some um, uh, kind of more, like I said, kind of bracketed, more theoretical approach, using the tool, trying to develop the tools of uh, Shannon information theory, but kind of moving beyond notions of Shannon surprise and signals, but to also look at memory structure and correlation, in a sense, looking for a syntactic structure. So we're trying to develop algorithms, starting from information theory, but using some, some modern techniques for machine learning and also causal inference to try to infer syntactic structure and animal vocalizations. And then from that, hopefully you can start to then infer going up one level in the hierarchy that there's some sort of causal cause and effect relationship in a social setting. And then going another level up, you can say, oh, that interaction was to help them coordinate in their breaching. And of course, all of this has to be done sort of in time to look at that dynamics emergence. Languages aren't static. So, um, so that's the kind of theoretical side. So we're bringing some new methods from machine learning, from causal inference to bear on this. Um, but then there's also the, 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 the field season. Our sort of very large sanctuary is uh, Frederick Sound up in the Alaskan Panhandle. So this is a quick proposal, um, what we're thinking of doing. So now 
given these theoretical challenges, how do we extract meaning? How do we extract cause and effect interactions? And how do we see how that relates to social functional behavior? We need long-term and real-time monitoring and not just passively recording, but actually interacting with the animals. Brenda already alluded to this. You can, in fact, it's even a, it's a theorem in, in, in machine learning theory that if you can interact with your subject, teacher subject, you can learn more quickly, you can teach more quickly. So we're hoping to use interactions and acoustic playbacks to, to look at that. Again, the, the, the sort of setting for trying to understand the basic question of what is intrinsic meaning in the signal, we want to put that in, in the context of social behavior. But then there's this long list of sort of needs that we hope this observatory will uh, address. Being able to have a good data set so we can start to, using time of flight of acoustic signals, start localizing the vocalizers, tagging them with individual identification. Then once we have their X, Y, Z, and name, tracking them in three dimensions. Um, also environmental monitoring. And like I said, some way of not only having hydrophones that record sounds, but actually putting in speakers so we can generate sounds and start to interact with them. A couple of people have already alluded to this thing. Valeria mentioned how long it took to analyze some of this. I mean, it's great. So one thing that's happened is we have fantastic monitoring and recording technologies. Huge data sets are now being generated. The problem is it's unbelievably tedious to go back through all of that and try to classify the sounds. So we're trying to think about using these modern inference methods, how to automatically detect calls, sound elements in song, and then automatically do the data reduction. And then hopefully the system will report back to us where there are interesting uh, uh, events happening in, in the hydrophone recordings. Um, the next step beyond that would be once we're identifying interesting structures, we can capture those in real time and possibly play them back to see if we can get a response from the animals. The idea is to close that loop so that we're actually genuinely interacting some kind of very impoverished conversation by trying to close that feedback loop so we can learn more quickly what the animals will attend to. Now, how is this going to work? Well, it's actually uh, it's, it's not a modest scale project. We're talking about hundreds of hydrophones and transducers. It's very compute intensive, pulling down terabytes, if not petabytes of data in a year. Uh, all this, of course, is going to be pushed up through uh, to the internet through satellite links. Um, right now, I'm sort of fleshing out a design for just proof of concept uh, of a few hundred thousand dollars, but a permanent installation plus an endowment would be about a million dollars. To be a little more concrete about this though, the, uh, this is a picture of the inside passage in the Southeast Alaska Panhandle. The blue trajectory you see there was my third trip in, in, in uh, August, circumnavigating the central island there's called Admiralty Island. And uh, the area where we kind of concentrating on for now is called Frederick Sound down there in the bottom corner. Now, why down there? Well, A, there are lots of whales like you just saw. That's where we recorded all those breaching events. Um, kind of on the east side of Frederick Sound there. Um, but then there's also uh, the Navy uh, a few years ago donated to the town of nearby town of Petersburg, this lighthouse. And it's still a working lighthouse, but the, we're sort of considering the design centered on the lighthouse because it can be kind of a, a mission control op operations, kind of beautiful 1930s design uh, built like a tank. Uh, thank goodness, because the storms are quite something out there. Uh, even comes with its own helipad but the Navy no longer lands there because it's all decrepit. When they drop off the services for the lighthouse, they actually hover the helicopter and people have to come down on ropes, just like you see in the movies. And then they get picked up that way. So it also gives you a nice picture of, of Frederick Sound, really quite beautiful place. Um, so this is the bathymetry, a map of that area of Frederick Sound. Um, very quickly, uh, sort of in the upper uh, northeast corner there was our field season in 2019 over in Hobart Bay on Entrance Island. Um, but then the idea is to have a, a, a sort of a, the main control center be on the Five Finger Lighthouse Island there in the center, and then to pl place hydrophones and, and speakers in an array around the lighthouse there, connected by kind of a local area network where they can communicate in real time, both, both directions, recording the hydrophone and actually putting sounds out to these these nodes that are both hydrophone and, and, and loudspeaker. So the plan there is um, to have this 
24-7, constantly recorded environment using sort of modern uh, uh, inference techniques to do uh, animal localization, separate out from these cocktail party cacophonies, individual sounds, find out the XYZ location, and then track the trajectories of the animals in real time. And of course, that's a lot of computing. So the plan is that this is going to go up into the cloud, into the satellite internet, and to be processed. Uh, this hopefully will all be available for other people to look at and to start to study animal uh, communications there. So thanks. That's the story. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, uh, for these thought-provoking uh, presentations. One of the things that I want to talk about um, is, is the idea that all of the things we're talking about here um, overlap. And, and I want to ask very briefly, because then I want to get to the Q&A, what are some of the things from the perspective of designing the sanctuary that we can do to make sure that the kinds of science that you're talking about and you've been talking about can be done, can be facilitated? What do we need to build in um, so that these things can happen? Whoever wants to take that, um, Valeria? I, I have to say an observation tower. And I know- We've got that, one. Oh, so we'll, that's we'll perfect. We'll have an observation tower. Okay, we'll, so I was yep. looking at the shape of the sanctuary and going, that's great that you'll have platforms around, you know, but the sanctuary is big. So I'm envisioning a centered tower very much like what we had at Bay St. Marguerite. And it is such a pleasure to conduct observations from a tower because the whales forget you're there you're in the center of things. They surround the tower. And also, it's the, the towers are generally really great places to deploy a hydrophone, although you, you know, the idea is probably at the sanctuary to have permanent hydrophones and to, to launch a drone. Um, and another thing I was thinking about, because I was I was, you know, brainstorming about how to do the, the footage synchronized with recordings thing, which has been so helpful to advance our understanding of how belugas communicate. It's just so important to pair visuals with acoustics, which we rarely have been able to do. And, you know, you're not always able, you're not going to always be able to fly a drone. It's windy. You know, you might not be want to, you know, maybe it's intrusive, maybe it's noisy, you know. So, there's these things coming up more and more frequently that are like balloons, tethered balloons with a little drone that you could mm. perhaps attach to the tower and have a bird's eye view constantly of what is going on uh, in the sanctuary. Just, just throwing ideas. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's a great idea. I mean, we certainly are going to have an observation tower. We have pictured that to be on the land, not in the center, but... Um, I mean, these are all things that we can work with to see how we can make these kinds of things happen. Um, uh, the good part is that um, we're talking about this now and some of these things can be designed right in. Um, so that's a great idea. Anyone else? Can I jump in? So Brenda and I are knee deep trying to unpack <laughs> all of this, you know, multi-week long recordings. So I have a really boring, boring suggestion, but time code everything. Time code everything. Yeah. Yeah. Recordings, video, uh, people talking, notes. And, so, so, and it's actually a non-trivial thing uh, to get these things, these, these different data sources fused together with the good time code. And God, it's without that, you're wasting so much time. And I think it's actually such a fundamental thing. You should be thinking about it early on. Okay. I mean, what we're going to have security 24-7, 365 with hydrophones and video cameras, and we're going to have a lot of um, input. Um, but, but it's really important to know that we, we need to time code. They all need to be synced up. Yeah. They, they do. Yes. Very yeah, good. Me, the, the use of drones is a revelation. And Valeria, I know you know all about this, but this <laughs> season we had a couple of people with drones. And it was extraordinary what we could see. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. think it's and 
Are they getting better? I mean, yes. noise wise, like noise wise, are they very noisy or are they have has do they disrupt the animals behavior at all? We're, we're actually conducting a study in the St. Lawrence, just okay. writing it up yep. um, uh, to determine what are the lowest altitudes at which you would not disturb the whales. And, and the, the key altitude seems to be, and, and again, this is just take this with a grain of salt. We're, we haven't put out the paper yet, but it, there seems to be a quite a, a, a definite boundary at around 20 meters. About 20 meters. Uh, and, but it, it depends a lot on, on weather conditions. If it's windy, the whales won't hear the drone. If the whales are underwater, the, the water air surface makes it so that they won't hear the drone as much as if whales are, you know, uh, socializing and spying exactly. like, exactly. mandibles right. out of the water, you know. So right. it, it is so, it varies a lot, but there's, you know, it's definitely a consideration. Yeah. Right. And we're trying to be nice, but, you know, for better or worse, the poor whales have to deal with boats us bothering them uh we were in the inside passage there which is a great tourist spot or at least the cruise liners think it's a great tourist spot they generate huge amounts of noise so somehow the animals they seem kind of robust that was a little bit our conclusion we, we were concerned about this but i think the drones are the least of their worries so it's yeah. like optimistic uh, yeah. there was a recent paper which i'll share that we shared in our group um um, on measuring this, the, the, the effect of drone sounds on, on whales. So. I think that will be very important um, for the sanctuary too, to yeah. really know what those boundaries are. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything, David? Well, you, will, will you have passive acoustics? Oh, you bet. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, yes. A lot of passive, passive acoustic monitoring. Um, That's why I'm kind of hoping for some sort of... Back, well. Sorry. <laughs> it's some communication going on. Oh, I totally apologize. Um, that's why I'm really hoping we can develop some sort of automated system because then you could do passive acoustic monitoring 24 seven, right? right? And you're exactly. able to automate detection and classification or at least the measurement of the signals. You then have a huge amount of information that can mm -hmm. tell you what's going on in your sanctuary whales that could then be used to help us design experiments for wild populations. Exactly. That's exactly the thing. I mean, we have to take these data anyway. We will be taking these data in some form. So let's make a data that we can use and is not just, you know, for show. It's actual data. It's real. It's meaningful. It's substantive. And it tells us, it allows us to actually do something real. Um, I think that's, that's uh, extremely important. Um, the let's only see. thing I might add is it's, it's not just, well, in addition to the uh, time coding, time alignment is really important because if you're going to do localization, then milliseconds matter. Um, mm. And doing that kind of time alignment, is, it's, 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 it's a difficult problem. It's clocks drift, uh, GPS is, is hard. So that, that's one. And then two is you guys have this incredible advantage of having a fixed environment roughly. So doing all the calibrations, like, and it's like sending out a known signals and figuring things out, figuring out the, uh, the, the resolution of your, mm -hmm. uh, of your, uh, of your rays, I think is going to be like a fantastic advantage. Yep. As I yeah. just have to say that the time aligning alignment, uh, uh, comment is so dead on in our study in the St. Lawrence, we just couldn't, it, it, you know, the, the drone and the recordings were always about four seconds apart until we figured out that we could do the equivalent of the clap. And so what we did is we would, you know, we'd have the hydrophone, we would fly the drone and we would have the drone, you know, film the tower. And then one of us would go with a metal tool, bong, and hit the tower. And that... <laughs> That would be recorded. Yeah. That would that bunk would be in the recordings, and then you'd see it visually, and then you'd synchronize both both exactly to the second. But very very important, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, please. I I have a, a question here. We have a lot of questions, but I'm trying to pick out some that we can all sort of uh, chime in on for the few remaining minutes. Um, in terms of things like contact calls, I mean, when you really think about them, right, we call them contact calls. Do we have uh, 
any evidence that whales will make contact calls when, I mean, what are the parameters of when they make them? Will they make them for individuals who are not there, <laughs> who are there, but at a distance? What is the actual, you know, yeah. way that they use them? Yeah, that's definitely one of the questions that we haven't answered. We don't know if, if uh, whales use each other's contact calls to address each other very much like we would address each other by name. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. know that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they do that. Maybe that's one of the kinds of, of, of you know, experiments or, or data that we can take at the sanctuary. Do, do whales use each other's contact calls and do, you know, does that elicit a response from the whales? What we have learned both uh, through our initial very early studies uh, at an aquarium and then in the wild is that there are certain contexts that definitely favor the production of contact calls. And that's when there is a very immediate need for group cohesion. So in the case of the, of the mm -hmm. entrapments, you know, yep. the whales trying to establish contact with, with the herd that stayed outside the canal. We don't know, but suddenly the contact call production increased from the typical 10% or so of the repertoire to 80%. So it's, that's all they were doing. Um, when uh, when uh, moms and calves are calling each other, so, so that's pretty much the only call you hear. Yeah. Uh, when, when whales are born, again, in an aquarium situation, we would not have known uh, that otherwise, uh, that's pretty much the only call the mom makes. Um, when whales die, there's a, an incredible event in the wild, in the St. Lawrence, of a mother pushing its dead calf. And there's pictures of this uh, from 2008, I believe, only producing contact calls over and over and over again. So it's not just situations of contact, but potentially situations of stress or of need or of mourning. You know, we haven't disentangled all the reasons why they might Use them. I think that's really critical to understanding the experience of these animals when they come into the sanctuary, as Brenda was talking about, having a toolkit for monitoring their psychological state, their state of stress, their, you know, just what, what could be going on in their minds. Um, and, and that's, I think, a very, very important point to make is to really consider all the ways that they use contact calls and how they could be correlated with stress yeah. as well as so many other mental states. Um, I, I think that is certainly the case. In terms of behavior, what do we have to do to correlate behavior, non-acoustic behavior with acoustics? We're gonna be again taking behavioral data, observational data, visual, data 24 seven. What are some of the things that we can do to that are maybe out of the box that would allow us to bring the acoustics together with the behavior? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. You mean beyond it on, the technology, right? Depends on what animals are communicating about, right? What yeah. are they communicating? I mean, contact calls are a great example of, of although you've just said, Valeria, that Sometimes they're produced in context of perhaps mourning, which is a very different kind of context than contact. Um, so if you don't have a one signal to one context kind of system, it makes it quite difficult yeah. to know what the meaning is. And I think that's where Jim is sort of heading is trying to get meaning through other mechanisms because it, we can't always have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Yeah. It, language certainly doesn't work that way, right? So. Yeah, and implicit in what I was saying before is you almost have to think about, so Laura, you're asking about how to design your sanctuary. You kind of have to think about this a little bit backwards. What questions are you asking? And these different levels in the hierarchy I talked about, suddenly, in fact, they're kind of distinguished by almost an exponential increase in the amount of data you need. Because for example, you're talking about contact calls. Well, that is actually a claim of cause and effect. That's not the same thing as just looking at the distribution of you know, flukes or something like that. Mm -hmm. that, that, that. That requires a higher dimensional distribution. And to estimate that higher dimension, you need more data. 
So you really have to think also backwards. What questions am I going to go to? And then that's going to tell you, oh, gosh, I actually have to sample at microseconds. But Asa just mentioned time of flight. If I want to know where the animals are, it, yeah, it's, it's certainly sub millisecond timing in the, in the time of flight of the acoustic signals. So each one of these questions you're interested in kind of unpacks and kind of drives. And sometimes it's a little bit sobering. <laughs> the accuracy that you need, the number of hydrophones that you need, the, the amount of data you need. Um, but then, you know, hopefully we're in a good time. We actually can store yeah. that data, we can process it, and some new algorithms that, that Asa was alluding to. That right, exactly. Algorithm about this. So our job really, I mean, we've got a lot of sophistication on the back end, and our job is to reverse engineer it as much as we can so that we can anticipate what we what kinds of questions will be guiding right. <laughs> um, the work and then the kinds of data that we need to answer those questions. Of course, you know, all of this is changing so rapidly that we'll never be like totally ahead of it, but we can at least start to ask questions that um, do double duty as a, a way to understand how these animals are experiencing the sanctuary, how they're doing, are they healthy psychologically and physically, um, and, and also actually learn something really interesting and important about them. So um, with that, I, I can only thank you enough. We, I, we are go I'll be back with each of you. We have a thousand things to talk about obviously, and this is just to sort of whet everyone's appetite about the kinds of conversations that we can have in this context of the sanctuary. So David had to leave um, a little bit early, but I want to thank Aza, Valeria, Jim, Brenda uh, for an incredible conversation. And uh, I want to thank the audience also for, for great questions and hanging in there with us. And uh, we will see you next time. Look for our next webinar, uh, which will be next month. Thank you very much, everyone. Be well. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Lori.